Hey everyone, back again. Welcome back to the Convo Couch. It's just me today and I'm going to have uh, Johnny also have some input. And we have a quick show today. I just kind of wanted to go over what's happening in Palestine and what's going on with, in Gaza because I haven't really seen it be covered at all. And I wanted to talk about why that is and the silence that is so deafening in American media in the mainstream when it comes to Palestinian lives. So leaders in Israel and Gaza reportedly reached a ceasefire since, and this was after an intense three days of the fighting leaving Palestinians, um, 25 of them dead and four Israelis dead. So according to the Washington Post, the Israeli forces had shot dead two Palestinian protesters taking part in the Great March of Return protests on Friday that have been going on for the last 13 months. And then the Palestinians shot and wounded two Israeli soldiers in return. And then Israel carried the airstrikes on the refugee camp, killing the Palestinian militants. And then after that, the heaviest combat took place on Saturday and Sunday, and they sh shot about 70 rockets into Israel from Gaza. And then, of course, there were 350 airstrikes targeted. So this whole thing has been obviously a back and forth situation, but it is not as simple as blaming Hamas and is not as simple as um, blaming um, it, Israel, the Israeli people as a whole. But what we have is we have a right wing dictatorship through Netanyahu. And Johnny, you have a, a video, correct? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, which video? The one that from the tweets? Um, let's see if we can show the one you have on the screen. Oh, this video? Yeah. It's just RT. Um, yeah, we can watch it if you want. Yeah. They explain it pretty well. For residents of the south of Israel who live within a 40 kilometer radius of Gaza. Now, this does confirm that the truce that was brokered at around 4 30 Monday morning is holding up. It was brokered by Egypt and the United Nations. This has been the bloodiest weekend of violence on the Israeli side. Four Israelis were killed, which is the highest fatality Israel has suffered since the last Israel Gaza war back in 2014. But on the Palestinian side, 24 Palestinians were killed, including a pregnant woman and a child uh, I actually find it interesting that like I mean like the the YouTube video itself was like oh Israel like this one was like Israel death toll rises to three and then like they never mentioned like the Palestine you know yeah right so they didn't mention the Palestinians because a lot of a lot of the the criticism is that they don't consider Palestinians people and our media specifically if you read what they say, they, they, they call them militant, the militant forces in Gaza. They, they say that they're the ones that are at fault. Um, but they don't talk about how the Palestinians have been occupied for a very long time. And they've been, they've been pretty much pushed and shoved to a point where they've had to defend themselves. So it's not as easy as saying, oh, look, these militants, look, it's Hamas. It's, it's a, a plethora of things going on. And you know, people in America freaked out about Notre Dame, and I have no problem with Notre Dame. I've been there. It's great. It's, it was beautiful architecture, and I have no problem with people being upset about it. But what I do have a problem with is that there's literally no mention of of this in the mainstream. Most people don't know or don't care. It's just this ongoing thing that's constantly happening, and it reflects our country's priorities. And it reflects where we stand, and we are definitely not... Um, equal in our support. We are definitely very pro-Israel. The United States, obviously, through APAC, through Trump's relationship with Netanyahu, through the Democratic Party, like their relationship with Netanyahu. You saw what happened to Ilhan Omar. This is just another thing. And I wanted to go through a series of tweets because Twitter is a little bit more, I guess, it's more bold when it comes to letting other people talk about how they feel about things. So there was this woman named Lena Alice Finn, and she said, Israeli airstrikes are now targeting residential buildings in the Gaza Strip. The number of Palestinians killed on Saturday. This was like when she was counting down. So there were five first, and then there were, and she has the names and the ages, and then there was more, nine of them. And then she kept giving us a report, and then 10, and then she it just went up from there all the way 
through when you're going to see the number 25. 25, I believe, is the number because the woman was pregnant. So they're counting that, I believe. And um, the ceasefire then was what happened next, which is good. But at the same time, we know that it's just right for right now. So a lot of people come up with the, oh, but Hamas. So Gaza blockaded has been blockaded for 12 years so Gaza has been occupied for 52 years the Israeli snipers have been shooting unarmed Palestinians weekly um, at these protests for over a year so living in Gaza is not anything that's calm or there's any kind of you know stop in violence even when there is a ceasefire so just saying that Hamas is is at fault here is is faulty it's wrong and it's ignoring the lives of the Palestinians. And I feel like America does that. America, when have you heard, Johnny, about anybody talking about Palestinian lives in any, you know, regard? Oh, never. They always just bring up, you know, it's like Israel and then like, you know, what's going on. Uh, I've heard Gaza. I mean, the Gaza protest is what I remember. Um, When was that? That was back in how long ago? Um, Well, they're constantly protesting, but I mean, they're... It, it's been it's been like a, a ten, tenuous year for sure, like for for a year. But I mean, they're constantly protesting. This has been going on for years. And it's right. Mainstream media is not really paying attention to no. that. They're paying attention yeah. to the uh, the uh, the Russia gate. Exactly. Exactly. So we're hearing Russia gate. We're hearing um, about Barr and, and still about Mueller. But we're not hearing about this. And I, I have to bring this back to Venezuela because when I was talking to Kevin Cease, Zeese, um, the other day, he was telling me how, you know, we're we're trying to still do the whole regime change in Venezuela and how we've done this time and time again. And we all know this, what we did in Central America in 2009, Hillary and Obama with Honduras. And now the Honduran people are suffering. They cannot be in their country and now they're having to come here which if i'm a republican i would support uh ending these regime change wars and this interventionism right so if 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 we care about humanity why are we constantly doing this if we want to go into venezuela because we care about humanity like what about the palestinians what about them what about the people in yemen and we are both supplying both the saudis and the uh, israeli military with money and weapons so that's how you know that we don't care about people. We just care about what they can do for us. And it's really shitty to say that as an American, but it is what it is. And so this is an Israeli attack on Gaza in numbers. So we have this really nice figure that gives you guys a comprehensive overall look as to what the death toll is, what the injuries are, how many people have been displaced, oh, and great. how many lives have been uh, destroyed, the houses, and all of that from... May 4th through May 6th of 2019. It's this one right here. Ah, uh, yes, that's it. Okay, perfect. And just so you guys have a look at that. And the reason I wanted to talk about this, too, was because I'm going to bring it back to Ilhan Omar. And Ilhan Omar is my favorite congresswoman right now. One, because she is amazing on foreign policy. She, second to Tulsi, like, just because she's just got in there, I feel like she can do so much. She, as a Somali Muslim woman who came here as a child, understands what it is to be an immigrant. She understands what it is to be a black Muslim. And she understands to be ostracized for who she is and, and standing up against APAC, as we saw. And Ilhan Omar was pretty much one of the few Congress people who said something about the attacks. Mike uh, Gravel also said something. But Ilhan said, how many more protesters must be shot Rockets must be fired and little kids must be killed until the endless cycle of violence ends. The status quo of occupation and humanitarian crisis in Gaza is unsustainable. Only real justice can bring about security and lasting peace. And she's right. And this is a very bold thing to say. And you notice how not even I looked, I looked, I looked for Tulsi's stance on this. I looked for Bernie's stance on this. I looked for AOC's stance on this. Uh, Rashida Tlaib was kind of said something, but not as bold as this. This puts a target on her back. And we've seen this target time and time again come out against her. And it's very important that we have someone in Congress that is so bold against the control that APEC has over our government. 
right? What do you think about that, Johnny? What was that? About the control that APEC has over our government and like how Ilhan is the the only one of the few people speak, speaking. Yeah, I think out. it's pretty crazy how like they're they're like targeting her like super hard. You know what I'm saying? Like back then when she made like those tweets and those comments and everything, like she uh, she got a lot of scrutiny for that. And like, man, APEC is like the mafia out here. Yeah, they're pretty much a mafia, and they're supported by the Democratic Party, which is the worst part. And Mike, Mike Crabble, who's running for president, by the way, um, he's really savage on Twitter. And I know, like, two younger people run his Twitter, but I'm pretty sure young people run everybody else's Twitter, too, including Bernie's. So um, Mike Crabble says, long live Palestine. And, like, I haven't even seen anybody give something more bold than that and you see like it's it's pretty awesome and i i would like to see him in the debates i don't know if he's gonna make it but it like his video is all it's so anti-war anti-regime change anti-imperialism and i really i really love that about him um and ilhan as well so he also said the bloodshed in Palestine and Israel will not cease until the fundamentally unjust existing structure is jettisoned. We cannot support a right-wing racist regime committed to annexation and gradual ethnic cleansing. There must be a binational state with equal rights for all. And I 100% agree with this take. I don't think there, you know, we should completely dismiss Israel's existence and I don't think we should but I think right now it's very one sided. It's very much like, oh, like the Israelis are getting what they want. And Netanyahu is doing what Nazis did, ironically, to to Jewish people a long time ago. He's eliminating them. They they look down on them. They don't consider them people. It is an apartheid ethnic cleansing situation we have. And we are complicit in it because we're not even saying anything about it. We're not talking about it. People don't even care to hear about this. And because they don't is exactly why we should. And the reason that this is even happening is because of us, because we are supplying them with so much money. We are supplying Israel with so much money. Did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's like it's just it's kind of similar to what's happening in venezuela right because like it's like right. all the darker people all the pue- del pueblo you know they're all supporting maduro <laughs> and um it's kind of like the same thing right palace are they they're darker skin well there's right? i mean yeah it, it's honestly it's more of like a, re- a religious thing too like mm. you know like the 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 jewish heritage versus the, the muslim heritage but it's honestly it all started because of the occupation of Israel because they were being pushed away if from World War Two. So they were being pushed aside. So then they, they came, they, you know, they went everywhere. They, they went to different places because they didn't have anywhere to go. And then uh, then they started occupying Palestine. But then, of course, Netanyahu is the problem. It is not the, the people. Uh, of Israel that are necessarily the problem. It is Netanyahu and his right wing problem, right? We can't attribute the problems of America to all the people in America. The like Trump is a problem. The Democrat, the Democratic establishment is a problem. It's not we're not we're not in support of Donald Trump. We're not in support of the establishment, many of us. So like that, I don't like to make, you know, vast generalizations about all these people. I think a lot of people that I know who are Jewish and who live here want peace and they want a solution and they want this to stop. And they have, you know, a very great understanding. Bernie Sanders is one of them. He's he's Jewish and his family died in the Holocaust. But even he has said time and time again, we need to stop doing this. We need to stop supporting Israel and Netanyahu and what they're doing. But in particular from this incident and what happened, because there was also firing from Gaza from the Palestinians, a lot of Democrats have remained really silent because uh, it's something that's kind of controversial. It is pretty controversial. Because they're they're making it. But really, honestly, like, let's put it this way. If I am a person and and I've been, you know, born and raised and now I'm 25 years old and I'm still in Israel, but it's in Palestine and I have no rights. My family, there's bombs every day. I'm going to become militant. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to participate in trying to end this through violence if you're not giving me any other outlet. So I think there's also that, that you can't push people to a point where they have nothing left but to retaliate. And the military weapons that Israel has that we give and that we provide 
are nothing are like so much greater compared to what the Palestinians have. It is a joke to say that it is an on an equal basis because it's not. And and any kind of me saying this or whether it's someone else saying this, uh, it doesn't mean we're anti-Semitic and we need to stop equating that. And there was there is a Facebook friend I have named Abba Timide who who is um, has been reporting on Facebook constantly on this issue. And he has said this is what Israel has terrorized with the residential bombing campaigns. These aren't Hamas fighters like Western media journalists are fabricating. So this is an entire different take. This is saying like the journalists here are fabricating that this is all Hamas. The criminal Israeli occupation is murdering innocent Palestinian families and their children. So when I w did a little research and I looked in into the, the pictures and what was actually happening and have, you know, have gone into it, I see that um, that he's right. A lot of a lot of the attacks are against the the families in Palestine, the civilians, the, the children, many, many children and and babies. So there's a series of pictures we have here that are very uh, intense, but they will show you. I think they should be seen because this is their lives every single day. This is what people are going through every single day. And the world is silent. The Western world doesn't care. And honestly, there were more, but I uh, it, they, they were pretty graphic. So but this is their lives and there's something else happening it's called eurovision song contest it's kind of like an american idol and that's happening in this this year and it's going to take place in tel aviv which is in israel technically and it's themed dare to dream that is the theme and this is what the palestinians under occupation have said when they were asked about their dreams حلمي بسيط جدا وهو ان اتمكن من زياره منزل جدي في في مدينه يافا المحتله والتي اقيمت عليها تل ابيب الان اني انا عايشه بوطني عن جد بامان عايشه بالمنطقه اللي انا مرتاحه فيها مش حاسه اني مظلومه مش حاسه انه انه حدا رح ياذيني انا حابه بس اطلع اكون محاميه عشان اطلع كل الاسره ومعهم اخوي حلمي الوحيد انه اشوف كل العالم موجود في داخل مدينه القدس وقاعد انا بشرح لهم باللغة العربية الرواية الفلسطينية أو الأثرية حول تاريخ مدينة القدس وحلمي أني أكون راقصة بلي وأنا كشاب فلسطيني بحلم في هذا اليوم أنه إحنا كشباب فلسطيني نشارك في الاحتفالات العالمية ونشارك في كل المؤتمرات العالمية وإحنا للأسف لليوم بنقام في قصة الحصار ولليوم مش قادرين لا نتحرك وكل حرية تنقلنا محكومة من قبل هذا الاحتلال اللي أنتوا رح تساعدوا تشريعه We just want peace, fam. <laughs> they I want peace. They just want, yeah, they want peace. Um, but here's the thing: it's kind of ridiculous to have it. It'd be like having like the Olympics, you know, like right next to all of this that's happening. It's it's a little ridiculous, and a lot of artists and a lot of people are asking boycotts of this thing because it's it's people are literally dying and being murdered, and it it just doesn't. It's not right to be celebrating that. So, so explain to me again. What, what was that? What was it? it? Was a Euro festival? It's a contest for singing. It's a singing contest. Oh, a singing contest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So they were like kind of you know giving their what they want and and what their dreams are because that's the theme of the contest. Okay. But they just want you know they have basic dreams like everybody else. They're people. I think is the whole point, right? Like they're people, and oftentimes we don't think about people in these countries and 
people in Yemen and people in, in Palestine and people in Syria. We don't think about them as people. We think about them as war, war ridden, you know, survivors or casualties often. And Americans need to start seeing them as people. It's the same way we don't see the homeless as people. They're just the homeless. They're still people. They're still human beings. And this is a way in protest to show that they're still people. Um, but I wanted to move on to the next subject. And there's going to be more on Palestine because there's a lot to talk about. And Pasta and I are going to talk a lot about the Middle East and, and kind of our involvement in there. But I wanted to talk about how the Department of Education, as many of you know, many millennials and Gen, Gen Zs, is privatizing education and is profiting off student loan debt. So I wanted to talk about personally, I have some student loans. I don't have as much compared to other people, um, but I've been making monthly payments like everybody else. And just a couple days ago, I got a letter that said that they took my tax money to pay towards the, the, the student loan debt I owed, which doesn't make any sense because I'm not defaulted. And um, I'm like working on fixing it with them because they can't do that. I mean, technically, they should never be able to do that, but they can do that now. If you default on your student loans, they can take it from your taxes. They can take it from your wages. And I got and if any of you have ever borrowed money from the Department of Education or have student loans to the Department of Education, you're going to get a notice that says, hey, Bet from Betsy DeVos, that says, hey, um, if you don't make a plan and if you default in any way, shape or form, then we have the right now to seize money from your empl employer. Uh, this is actually disgusting because imagine the people that are going to be most targeted for this. Imagine the people who are going to be the ones suffering are the people that obviously are defaulting for a reason. You know, if you default, it's either because you didn't get the, the notice or you're, you're, you moved, but more than likely it's because you can't afford to pay the loans. And a lot of people, you can easily default. I read, I've read multiple stories about people defaulting because they, they couldn't pay the rent and they couldn't pay their car. Then they needed to get to work. And it's just, it's just like a, a snowball effect of what's causing people to not be able to pay these loans. And the fact is a lot of people have garnered about hundreds of thousands of dollars in these loans and they can't pay them back because the job that they were told they were going to get isn't paying them what they were told or the job isn't there or whatever the case is, they're not able to afford it on top of all of their bills, on top of our economy where people are having to work three to four jobs on top of all of that, it's it's this kind of burden that we have in this generation, this generation that's supposed to be making more money than the previous generation who had it so good because, yes, boomers had it so good because when they went to college, it was virtually free. Bernie Sanders talks about this all the time, all the time. And ha whereas the millennials, when we went to college, not only did, did the price skyrocket, but in addition to that, right after while we were in college, the the market, Wall Street, all of that happened with the, the back, banks being deregulated. So we've had to deal with a lot for the amount of time we've lived in. So I'm one of many cases, but there's a, a link to uh, what I wrote on Medium and you guys can read it whenever you please. I kind of just kind of went through pretty much why I am so involved in this movement and why I am so active. One of the reasons is because our generation and Johnny is part of the millennial generation too, is affected unfairly. We are paying the price for what the people before us did. We had no say in the war in Iraq. We had no say in deregulating Wall Street. We had no say in the crime bill. We had no say in anything that we are now having to, to you know, to involve ourselves in. And What's worse is that the people coming after us, like the Gen Zs and thereafter, they're going to be the ones that are suffering even more because they're also going to deal with the worst of climate change and, and what's happening. And if you saw the report from that's been going on from the, the UN where we like things are far worse and species are dying and everything's on the brink of extin extinction. Bernie Sanders was right when he said our primary number one threat is climate change. And people laughed at him when he said that, but he was right. So I just kind of go through why I'm fighting. But 
going back to the, the loan situation, according to the current projections, the federal government has set to make a profit of over $110 billion on the student loan programs over the past 10 years. So this is how much money they're making off of your debt, off of education that shouldn't be, you know, it should be free. And um, that is how much revenue these people are making. And Betsy DeVos has actually made it worse. So these people aren't held accountable for fraud. And she did lose a recent case, but it's still happening. It's still happening everywhere. And the people who are most affected and most targeted are working class, young people. So you have anything to say as someone who has loans and someone who's a millennial? Yeah, these loans suck. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, Bernie has said before that, you know, you could work a summer job and then be able to pay yeah. for the year. Like, yeah. I wish I could do that. Like, I wish ah, I wish like I could go back and, you know, and study even more. Like, I want to study. I study engineering, but uh, I want to study like philosophy also, you know, so it'd be. Yeah, no, you can't do that. And, and in, in fact, if you went into philosophy, people would have told you not to because you're going to be poor if you study philosophy. Like, we shouldn't live like that. Society should want your people to be educated. You as a country should want your people to be educated. Um, but if we have an educated youth who doesn't go into the military, who's going to fight the wars that they constantly engage in? And I think the youth is realizing that. And so let's talk about Bernie's plan quickly. Bernie has unveiled hasn't unveiled his entire plan, but so far he has the basic make public colleges tuition and university tuition free, trade schools too, including for those people who don't really want to go the academic route. He wants fully funded historically black colleges and universities. He wants to substantially lower student debt and significantly lower interest rate on student loans. So this is all wonderful. It's also great. But my criticism of Bernie is he doesn't go far enough. Elizabeth Warren, on the other hand, has a more comprehensive plan. And I love Bernie and he's my guy. But this is where she beats him. The question is, will she follow through? So her plan is to have the government wipe out $50,000 in debt for individuals living in households that make less than $100,000 a year. Ooh. I have way less debt than that. <laughs> like literally that would completely just that absolutely wipe everything out so i i just think and it's it's i just think that would be life-changing and higher earners would receive less but according to an analysis um she commissioned from brand brandis researchers the program would write off at least some debt for 95 percent of borrowers even borrowers making more money and three quarters would have their entire balance cleared. So this is going to affect a lot of people. If if she were to become president or even vice president or even be in Bernie's cabinet, I would encourage Bernie to adopt her proposal. And I think he said that he supports a lot of what she's saying and she supports a lot of what he's saying. And I wanted to bring this up, not because I, I necessarily trust Warren because I don't necessarily trust her. And I do think that she's still part of the establishment. But I do think that her policy on education and her ideas on our education are extremely thorough. And I, I have to be unbiased. I mean, they're extremely thorough. They're, they go further than what Bernie has so far. Bernie put all these ideas on the table. But now, you know, she's taking them a little bit further. And I think, honestly, that'd be that would be life-changing for so many people. I agree. <laughs> and uh, what Trump is doing, though, Trump is doing the opposite. He, a bigger concern than even DeVos and her department, they're awarding new loan service contracts to all of them without adopting any new reforms to prevent these companies from gouging loan holders and running up the bill to the federal government. So the, a lot of the problems stem from a lot of people Let's say you borrow $20,000, the interest rates keep going up, then you end up owing twice as much or more than you initially borrowed, which is ridiculous. We like this is education. This isn't supposed to be a for profit system. We have we have lowered in, in the scales of being having the most educated populace because we are so burdened by debt and a lot of people would be going to school more and would be learning new things and would be contributing to society if they didn't have debt. And and again, this is how they're doing it. And the Department of Education contracted um, has, has just contracted a college student loan service company with financial ties to 
Devos, you guys know that she has her own hand at stake with this. And the Department of Justice under Donald Trump has sided with college loan service firms that the state attorney general says have violated college student loan debt forgiveness rules. So all of this is a result not just of of um, Donald Trump, by the way, Joe Biden, in case you guys don't know, he voted against having loans be eliminated when you file for Chapter 7. He's never been a, a fan of uh, millennials. He says we complain too much. So I just kind of wanted to go over that because I think it's so important for this generation and and for pushing kind of someone like Bernie and maybe someone like Tulsi and these progressives who are good on everything. But I'm looking at Warren and I'm like, her plan for education is is completely bold. It's bold and no one's done it. And I think it's it's something that she could definitely siphon votes away from Bernie in this because it matters to so many millennials who have student loan debt. So, yeah. Uh, so um, here's a couple of things. So mm-hmm. do you think... Uh, do you think Warren would ever like take a position in Bernie's cabinet or something like that? I 100 percent think so. I think that 100 percent like, do. You know the uh, what is it? A secretary <laughs> of uh, education or what is it? Uh, maybe Harvard I education? think she would be better as someone in his cabinet. Maybe treasury, maybe uh, something to do with economics or something. Because she's pretty strong on that in that regard. Um, you know she's not polling high enough to be a contender for the presidential race, unfortunately, because Biden. And and Buttigieg are the ones that are polling higher. And we're going to go through those polls again next time because they're all they're all just wrong. Um, And it's not because I like Bernie. It's because they're wrong. And um, but yeah, I I think it would be beneficial. And I think Bernie has said he's willing to adopt her positions and vice versa. So I think that would be something that I think we could make it vocal to Bernie like, hey, this is a great idea, I think, and I I would suspect he would be on board with that. I wouldn't think he'd be like, no, screw you guys. You know, he's all about that. So I'm with it. I'm with it. He could do better on that. I think so. he'd be on board. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to close it out? Yeah, like that's all we have today, guys. I got to go. Thanks for watching. Pasta and I will be back, I believe, on Thursday. Yeah, I believe Thursday is what we Thursday. have on the schedule. I uh, just want to thank MCSC Network. We have yes. 37 people watching right now. We did actually get a super chat. And oh, uh, he said, uh, 28 days later, <laughs> five, five, nine, five bucks. And he says, so anyone hear about Ron Paul endorsing Tulsi Gabbard as the best Democratic candidate? Yet? I did. I did hear about that. Ron Paul um, is has a very anti-war stance. And I believe that is why he endorsed Tulsi. Um and a lot of people who have anti-war, anti-interventionist stances, who that's their number one issue, are going to endorse, endorse Tulsi because she is extremely strong on that. She's the strongest on foreign policy of, of the candidates to me. Bernie is second, but she's definitely stronger uh, in that regard. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad that she's getting endorsements. I'm not. Uh, some Bernie supporters get upset. Like, I'm not upset at all. I, I, I love her. I think she I think she's wonderful. I think we need to hear the things she has to say. I think like Ilhan, she's bold when it comes to in our, our interventionism, which is the root cause of all of the problems that we have. When they tell you we have no money for free public college, we have no money for health care, you need to just save the ACA and deal with it. Um, they're giving away money to Israel, to Saudi Arabia, to, to the military industrial complex. They, they're taking the money from you and giving it to them. And and for what? For a few elites and for, for, for more power, for oil, for gold, for things that you and I have absolutely no access to. And I it's it's literally like the main injury. It is literally like in the artery. It is that's what we need to attack. We need to stop looking at band aid solutions. So that's why I think she's one of the, the best candidates that's gonna push that idea out there, just like gravel is too he's also constantly talking about that so any anybody else have a comment uh no i just want to you know just say thank you to uh everybody on the combo couch rocky valinger we see you martini 1179 the real world human he's saying we started twitter uh a year ago uh this month oh yeah um and then well they don't tweet much but we're gonna start picking up on fred that. edward i see vic s marcus hover oh love public domain 
Uh, they're having a savage argument. Let's see. <laughs> Jordan Reynolds, Mr. Reed. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, so you guys, for watching. Please like, share, subscribe to the Combo Couch. Also, MCSC, if you're not there already. But please go over to our Combo Couch and subscribe because we put out specific videos there that we don't always put up on the network. That's right. And we have a great one on Buttigieg. We have a great one coming up on interventionism. I also have one on Venezuela that I did with Kevin Zies, who is um, at the embassy right now in D.C., and he's keeping us informed on that. And we're going to just keep producing and putting out more clips. We have many of them with Tulsi, and she's wonderful. And, yeah, so keep watching, subscribe, like, share, please. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on Thursday at noon with pasta. Thanks for watching. Combo out. Bye.